We'll get started with our study as soon as Howard wrangles all the people away from the donuts and coffee. <laughs> we told him, say, maybe we need to put a speaker back there so they can hear that it's starting. But we're going to continue our, our study in the book of Galatians. We'll be in chapter 3 for the most part this morning. So if you want to start turning there, flipping there, clicking there, uh, we will get to Galatians chapter 3. Actually, we're going to start off uh, reading the text. So if you want to read along, it'll be on the screen too. But I'm also going to do something that they, they tell you when, you when you go to school to be a minister and some of the classes you take are on preaching. It's like, don't tell them the point of your sermon right off the bat. I'm going to tell you the point of the sermon this morning right off the bat. And we've, we've been using this idea of being set free. And this morning we're going to talk about being set free from the law. We are set free from law, and that, that is the point. And so I'm going to say it at the beginning to make sure you get it. And this may be challenging for some of us. I know it was challenging for me as I was studying for this, that we are set free from law. And Paul's going to make that abundantly clear. And then after we look at this text, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question that I think is going to maybe help us try to digest or analyze our own lives and how law and grace, how law and faith just seem to keep wrestling and, and banging up against each other in our own personal lives. So like I said, we'll be in Galatians chapter 3. I think they're going to flip the slides back there for me. And, and what I did was I highlighted things in some color. You know, green is good. Green means go. Green means do this. Red means stop. Red's bad. So everything that's highlighted red is referring to the law, which is also called a curse. And everything that's green is referring to faith, which is referred to as a blessing and some other words, and we'll get there. And so we're in chapter 3, and I'm going to read. Paul goes through this argument from really kind of verse 1, verse 2, over to verse 14. He, he goes through this argument. I'm going to go through it a little backwards. We're going to take the last paragraph, and then we're going to do the middle paragraph, and then we're going to do the top paragraph. You get the same thing, but, but it just arranges the argument in a different order than you might have read it before. So we'll start in chapter 3, verse 10. So listen to what Paul says here. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, Clearly, he says, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law, the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, whoever does these things will live by them. And I'll talk about that line there for a minute. In a, in a minute, it's kind of difficult. Whoever does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of Abraham. It's by faith that we receive the promise of Abraham. That, that difficult line up there in verse 12, uh, what Paul is doing, one, he's quoting from Leviticus, whoever does these things will live by them, and it's referring to the law. Whoever does these things, these things of the law, if they do them, if they follow them, they will be living by the law is what he's saying. And it's, and it's a contrast of what's at the end of 11. At the end of 11, he says, the righteous will live by faith. And then it's kind of confusing phrase. Basically what he's saying is a law person lives by law. That's the difference in those two verses right there. So let's go up to verse 7. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance of Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So th those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, who is the man of faith. Let's go up to verse 2. I would like to learn one thing from you. He's talking to the Galatian churches, this, this region of Galatia. He says, 
listen, you, you Galatians, you Arkansasian, what do we say in Arkansas? Arkansans, but we don't call it Arkansan. <laughs> Just checking, okay. Ar- yeah, you get the gist. A region. He's talking to these people in Galatia. He says to these Galatians, he goes, I want to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? He says, are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, that's things of faith, are you now trying to finish by human efforts? That's obeying the law. Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really is in vain? Does God, so he's asking the question again here, does God give you his spirit, and does he work miracles among you by your observance of the law or by your belief in what you heard? So also Abraham, he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. In those 13 verses... Paul contrasts faith and law 14 times. Those 13 verses, he contrasts it 14 times. And he says the the law is a curse. It it does not justify. It is not based on faith. And, And he says it again. It is a curse. The law is a curse. There is something true about the law that is not true about faith. And there's something that is true about faith that is not true about law. They are diametrically opposed. They are against each other. Because faith, he says, is where the Spirit comes from. Faith is where miracles come from. Faith is where is, is how we become children. Twice, he says, faith is how we are blessed. It's where righteousness comes from. And again, he says, the righteous live by faith, and it is by faith that we receive the promise. It's not by law. It never has been by law. It never will be by law. It's by faith. So the big question I got for us then is, if I'm not under law, why does it feel like I am? If, I, if I'm not under law, if I'm taking Paul's words here seriously about the difference between faith and law, and I'm not under law, why does it feel like I am? Why do I feel like there's these set of rules that I've got to maintain, that I've got to follow, that I've got to do? If I don't, I won't be right with God. Any of y'all share that kind of similar feelings? Yeah. I mean, I was raised in, I'll call it what it is, I was, la- I was raised under legalistic teachings. It was all about the rules. It was all about, you got to do this, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this, or you won't be right with God. And even today, I'm, I'm like working on these lessons, and I'm talking about being set free. Woohoo! It doesn't feel like it. And I'm trying to come to grips with this some myself, because uh, it it's like the legalism, even though I've been set free from it, even though I've, I've escaped from it, I've run from it, there's a part of me that wants to keep going back to it. And I've been set free. I think one of the reasons why I still feel like I'm under a law is because when it comes down to it, I just don't trust God. <laughs> I mean, I just, if we're talking about faith, and I guess my faith is weak, I just don't believe Him. It can't be that easy. It can't. Nothing in this world is that easy. It cannot be that easy. It can't just be faith in Jesus. That's crazy. It's got to be faith in Jesus plus doing something. Doing something else. Whatever that may be. But Jesus, and if you look through his teaching, it's not a lot. It happened four or five times, and there's something he keeps saying to them to his disciples and other people he comes in contact with, and he says, Oh, you of little faith. Every time he runs into some kind of problem with the disciples, a problem with someone else, it's always about a lack of faith. He never says, Oh, you who don't follow the rules good enough. 
He says, you of little faith. And look at these examples to, to Peter, who, who failed at walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14. As Peter began to sink, Jesus reaches out and he grabs Peter and he says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter was already walking on water. I would have been like, <laughs> you know. But he began to doubt. He began to look at the waves. He began to take his focus off Jesus. And the law of nature entered his mind. He said, this can't be right. This can't work. And he began to sink. And Jesus reaches down. He says, why did you doubt? Why is your faith after actually walking on water halfway to me or however close you got? Why now? Are you doubting? To the disciples in Matthew 16, who they were worried about not having brought enough bread. Jesus is really talking about something else, talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and something else, and they start whispering among themselves. They're like, I think he's talking about bread. We didn't bring any bread. I forgot to bring bread. Did you bring bread, James? No. How about you, Peter? No. Oh, my goodness. Well, who's in charge of bread this week? You know. And, and Jesus, Jesus says to him, he goes, you, again, you of little faith, one, that's not even what I'm talking about. But okay, let's say it is. Let's say it is. You're worried about bread. Have you forgotten the five loaves and the 5,000 people that we fed? Did you forget about all that? And all the baskets that were left over after was done? And, and the, the other loaves, what was it, four and that fed the 7,000? Or seven loaves that fed the 4,000? However many people. It's a lot of people that more loaves of bread, that these loaves of bread would have never fed. He's like, this has happened to you twice, and you're worried about us not having sandwich bread? Really? Oh, you of little faith. To the, the disciples who could not cast out a, a demon in uh, Peter, or excuse me, in Matthew chapter 17, when they asked, why couldn't we drive out this demon? They, they tried to drive out this demon. They're trying to do what Jesus told them to do, and, and like, why couldn't we do it? He says, because you have so little faith. And to the disciples in Mark 4, uh, when they were in the boat and he told the wind and the waves to be still, they're all freaking out. And he says, why do you have so little faith? Why are you so afraid? And I tell you, I'm like that. I think we can all share in that a little bit. I mean, I've seen Jesus do, the Lord do many good things in my life. And yet I still go, well, I just, I don't know if he's going to pull through for me this time. And it's not all about physical, tangible needs. I mean, I've prayed for someone's life to be delivered and it hasn't happened. But God's interested in our eternity, not just our here and now. So the other reason is, I'm afraid. Like the disciples, I'm afraid. And it's kind of back to that doubt, and that doubt brings in fear. That, that I'm, I'm afraid that faith can't, it can't possibly be enough. It just, there's nothing about it that makes sense. Because the economy of this world says that you can't just believe. I used to have a, a, a supervisor that, that said, uh, we, we would say something like, well, I believe so. And, and he'd say, well, I believe that for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows, but that doesn't make it true. I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, I had to think about that one for a little while. But his point is, is that it's got to be tangible. You know, in, in our world, in our economy, it's got to be tangible. There's got to be some kind of exchange. You're, you're not going to get something good without giving somebody something else. There's got to be an exchange. And, and, and I'm afraid that that, that economy, that, that's the primary economy that I know, that's... I'm afraid that, that that's got to be the economy of God and maybe I'm, maybe I'm not paying up enough. Maybe I'm not doing enough. Our righteousness, our being right with God, it is not measured by how much good stuff I do versus how much bad stuff I do. Like I'm ever... And part of this, like, I'm ever going to do enough good stuff to overcome the bad stuff. That's just, that's not how the economy of God works. And so we look at this and say, faith has to be accompanied by something else. And that the only something else that's possible is law. It's, it's got to be law. There's just, there's got to be some rules. 
Because if we say there's not any rules, what's going to happen? Chaos. That's what's going to happen. If we say there's no rules, right? Everything's going to. You guys are going to be running around throwing chairs and stuff like that. It'd just be. It'd be chaos in here. There's got to be some laws. So why do we like laws? Is it, is it because they're clear? Is it because uh, they're recorded and uh, we can go back and study them and analyze them? Do we like laws because then we can measure where we are? How, how well am I doing in obeying this law? Is it because they're not situational? Laws are cold and they're hard and they're fast. They say, do this and don't do that, and they don't really care about the situation. Is, is that why we like laws? Is it because they're strict? Because they're easy to interpret? Cecil Hook writes a book called Freedom in Christ, and, and this is what he says. He says, there are two levels of responsibility, and he uses a school zone as, as an example. Two levels of responsibility. One person passes a school with reduced speed and great caution because of their concern for the children. But another person speeds by with no concern. And for this reason, a sign must be posted that defines 15 miles an hour as the school zone speed limit. And then an officer, a police officer, has to be stationed there to enforce the law. The second person does not accept responsibility out of concern, so they must be forced to accept it by law. Paul explained in 1 Timothy 9 that, or 1 Timothy 1 verse 9, that the law is not laid down for the just. The law is not made for the just, for the righteous. It's made for the lawless and for the disobedient. See, the first person in that scenario doesn't need a law. They're going to slow down. They're going to take care. They're, they're, it's a heart matter for them. They're concerned about their fellow human. The other person, not concerned at all. The law is made for the person whose heart is not right. The problem in the region of Galatia is, that, is, is this same problem. People are saying faith in Jesus can't possibly be enough. And we, we looked at this the last couple of weeks, how in chapter 1... He talks about them turning to another gospel. And I, and I spoke about how I used to think that meant like some other God. And, and that's not what he's talking about. He's saying it's this twisted gospel. It's this perverted gospel. It's this gospel that says, yes, Jesus. Yes, his, his sonship, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his conquering of sin, his conquering of death. Yes, 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 yes. And you need to keep the gospel. Or, or you need to keep the law. It is the good news of Jesus, plus you've got to keep the law or you've got to keep some set of rules. That is this other gospel that the Galatians are turning to. And we talked about how we don't need to be people pleasers. We don't need to be, there's no requirement to be, I don't need to be a person who's trying to please other religious people because they want to add some kind of law or something to it. And then chapter 2, we kind of get the, the flip side of that in the sense that I don't need to be the person who needs to be pleased. Peter falls into that, and, and with some pressure from some Jews and things, he, he begins to back away. He's, he's been associating with the Gentiles, and he goes, oh, well, maybe these food laws are a little more important than I thought, and he begins to separate himself and separate himself and separate himself. And Paul comes in and like confronts him to his face. He goes, have you forgotten the gospel? This is not gospel. This separation thing, this, it's got to be your way or you can't be with people. That's, that's not gospel. And so what the Jews are pointing to, and what Paul is talking about here specifically in chapter 3 when he says the law, he is talking about the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. And so I thought it'd be cool. I spent a lot of time on this chart. All right, so... Y'all appreciate my little cartoon characters, but I also color-coded it. Um, I think it was late, yeah. So here we are, River Park, today. This is us. And we're reading a letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians. 
And he wrote this letter some years after Jesus' death, 30, 40, 50, 60, I don't know, somewhere around there, years after Jesus' death. And he's talking about this, this law thing. And the law came from Moses. This is Mount Sinai. So we've got the cross, we've got Mount Sinai. And, and I have this there because this might help us here in the next couple of weeks because there's several things that will connect to or be referred to as a representation of the law. So Moses is a representation of the law, saying the law is a representation of the law. Mount Sinai, where they got the law, that's the mountain Moses went up to, got the Ten Commandments, came down, right? That's a representation of the law. Next week we're going to talk about uh, Sarah and uh, Hagar, and one is free and one is a slave, and the slave represents Sinai and Moses and the law, whereas the free represents Abraham. I think I just might have given away all of next week's lesson. That's okay. But before the law, there was Abraham, who we read about. Abraham, the man of faith. Faith is how the promise is received. You may not know this. This might just blow your mind. There was 430 years with no law. 430 years, there was no law. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Back up. How did people follow God's will if there was no law? It's not about law. It never has been about law. It never will be about law. And so for 430 years, Abraham and his descendants and their descendants and their descendants all the way up until the exodus from Egypt and Moses goes up and gets this law, it was faith. It was faith, and it was only faith. And I probably should have put another green line like under this red one or something that faith continued, but we had this time period where there was faith and law. Faith and law. But that's not the end of the story. Mo, or Jesus represents faith also. And Paul clearly through his writing is representing faith. He is saying it's about faith, it's not about law. So here's Paul writing his letter sometime after the cross. And we love reading our Bible. Do you love reading your Bible? Everybody's like, I don't know, is that a trick question? Where's he going with this? I was at Tim Hawkins last night. A few of us went and saw Tim Hawkins. Anybody big Tim Hawkins fans out here? You're like, who's that? Okay, look him up on YouTube, Christian comedian. He's awesome. He told some joke last night, and I don't remember what it was, but he told some joke last night, and he kind of got like these little, a few like half laughs, like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, you guys don't even know if you're supposed to, it was like a, it was like a joke about church, and we're like, can I laugh at that? Because it's funny, it's true. <laughs> so here's Paul, so we, we get our New Testament, uh, we, we, we like our New Testament, I love the New Testament, I love reading, I I was all fired up about Galatians. I mean, every time I read it, I read a chapter or the next chapter or the next chapter, I was just like, whoa, set free, man, this is awesome. You also may not know this. It was about 300, if you want to throw this time in there, maybe about 350 years before we had a New Testament. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus, when he resurrected from the tomb, hand the disciples the New Testament and say, here, go and do thus? No. Paul wrote a letter. Some other guys wrote some stuff all in this area here. But even when they wrote a letter, I'm sure, Howard, have you ever received a letter at your house? Okay. I have not read it. Would you pick one and bring it to me sometime? Oh, thanks. So now Howard and I will have access to the letter plus the person who wrote it, but the rest of y'all won't. Maybe one day I'll come, I'll come share it with Kelsey. Kelsey, and you'll have a copy of the letter, and then the three of us, plus the person who wrote it, will have access. But still, the rest of y'all won't have it. That's kind of the way the New Testament came together. These letters were sort of in circulation, and some may have had access to, but it's, it's not like the day Paul wrote Galatians that it was handed to him in the New Testament. Here, by the way, you might want to flip over to Galatians. It was just a letter. Later, these things began to be assembled, and even Christian scholars and leaders of the church they weren't sure. They're like, well, we're pretty sure this book, this book, and this book, but I don't know about these other ones. And, and they would argue, and, and, and I don't mean argue in a nasty way. Maybe they would sometimes, but they would. It, it took time to get the New Testament that we have today. How in the world did the church survive without a New Testament? 
How did they, how did they know what to do? How did they know what all the rules were? It's not about rules. It's not about law. It never has been. It never will be. And so we've got to decide for ourselves when we look at the New Testament and when we read the New Testament, when I interpret the New Testament, when you interpret the New Testament, we've got to ask ourselves, is this a faith thing or is it a law thing? It's never been about law. It's about faith. And so it's going to affect how we're going to go out through the future. The third reason that I feel like I'm under a law is because I've begun to rebuild one. I've begun to make something law that isn't law and wasn't intended to be law. And this is, this is how we do it. We read the New Testament as if it's a law book, and it's not. And I don't think I can stress that enough. The New Testament is not a law book. And as long as we continue to try to make it a law book, we are making it something it was not intended to be. Here's how we do this. So, we're reading through our Bible. We come across Hebrews 10.25. You've probably heard this one before. Forsake not the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. We look at that and we go, see, look, that's a law. That's a law right there. The law says we have to go to church. If you want to please God, if you want to be right with God, you'll go to church. That's what the law says. And then we read like 1 Corinthians 16 or, or Acts chapter 20 talks about on, on the first day of the week. And we say, look, see, see, there's another one. There's a law. So we've got to go to church and we've got to go to church on the first day of the week. If you want to please God, if you want to be right with God, you'll go to church and you'll do it on the first day of the week. And then we get to Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Ah, there's another one. That's a law. When the church came together on the first day of the week, the, the law says, I have to break bread. I have to take communion. And, and we put all these law to, laws together and we say, we say, the law says, I have to go to church, I have to go to church on Sunday, and when I'm at church, I have to take communion. That is how I please God. And then we take it even a little further, and that means you can't take communion any other day but Sunday, because that's the only day they said that they would take it. That's not what's going on here. And just to give you an example, this forsaking not the assembly is not about church. It's about the community of believers are you engaged with other believers? Or are you isolating yourself? Are you just going off or whatever? And, and it's not a law thing. It's a heart thing. I'll tell you honestly, I hope, it's my prayer and hope that, that you are here at River Park because you want to be here. And I mean that, because you want to be here. I will never pressure you or guilt you to be here. It is not a matter of law that puts you here. And if a matter of law is the only reason you're here, then it's your heart that needs to be worked on. Because law is only concerned with what's on the outside. I love the talk. Madison, was that you? From, from the Lord's Supper about, about our, our vehicle. and It looks all clean and shiny. The law just says, hey, from the outside looking, what do I see? Looks good to me. The law is not concerned with the heart. And the heart is what's at the root of all of that. I mean, you can go read uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and sometimes we look at that and we try to make that all about law. Oh, you've heard that it said, don't do this. But I say, don't do this. But the way Jesus is addressing it is it's a matter of the heart. When he talks about adultery, what does he say? He says, you've already committed adultery in your heart. It's a heart matter. It's not an external action matter. So all of that that I just read there, this you've got to go to church, got to go to church on Sunday, gotta, because of the way we read the Scriptures is, is mishandling. Look what Paul says about Scripture, and if you want to go up to the next chapter, the last couple of verses of, of chapter 2. He says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, and the idea here is that he destroyed law in his life when when he had his Damascus Road experience and, 
and he met Jesus and, and his life was changed, his zeal for the law and for the traditions went away. And he said, I died to those. And so he says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, Jesus destroyed the law, you know, he fulfilled the law on the cross, but we have to destroy it in our own lives and say, you know what, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. And Paul's saying that's what he did. When I destroyed, uh, if I rebuild what I destroyed, he says, then I really would be a lawbreaker. The only thing you gain by law building is making lawbreakers. The only thing you gain from law building is making law breakers, not righteousness. And if the first half of Galatians 3, with its curses versus blessings, its law versus faith is not enough for you, this one should really hit at home. Romans chapter 9. Look at what the Israel, what, it, what he says about Israel. The people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness, they were seeking righteousness. They wanted righteousness just like we do. They were seeking it by the law. He says they didn't reach their goal. They did not reach their goal. And why didn't they reach it? They didn't reach it because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it was works, works of the law. So for 430 years, people of faith lived without a law. For about 300, 350 years, the church lived without the New Testament. It's not the law that makes us righteous before God. It's faith. It's not making the New Testament into a law book that makes us righteous with God. It's faith. It's never been about law. It never will be about law. It's about faith. I am set free. And you are set free from law. And as hard as it is to do, grasp a hold of that and stop trying to rebuild one. And so the last part here is like, well, so why do we try to rebuild one? It's, it's because we're afraid. It's because we don't trust God. There's probably a lot of other reasons. You may have a, you may have a different reason. But one good reason is because I think we just don't know how to live free. We don't know how to live free. It's scary for us. It's uncomfortable for us. I'm a big movie buff. I mentioned that um, several times. And so sometimes you'll see movie quotes or movie. I got a little video clip here I want to show you. In 1994, the movie The Shawshank Redemption. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Fantastic movie. Fantastic movie. And in there, it's a story of this guy named Andy Dufresne, uh, who was a banker, and he was framed for the murder of his wife and ends up in Shawshank Prison serving life sentence, serving a life sentence. While he was there, he befriends a guy named Red, and Red is played by Morgan Freeman. Eventually, through the story, Red gets paroled after, I think it's about 40 years in prison. He's been trying to... I mean, some of y'all aren't even 40 years old, so it's hard to imagine, but just, it's like, it's like, put a pause on my life when I was, you know, 10, and take the pause off when I'm 50. And imagine all the things that happened and changed in our lives. This was set in the earlier 1900s, but Red gets paroled, and he, he doesn't know how to live without the rules and the con constraints and the legal system of the prison. So watch, 